Good morning, and welcome to Promise Church. We're so glad that you've decided to join us for our online service today. We wanna to let you know about how to get connected with us. If you go to promisechurch.community on any of your devices, uh, you can get connected with us and, and be part of what we're doing here. Uh, right there, you'll see a yellow tab that says Get Connected. And if you've never been to Promise Church before, maybe it's your first time joining us, or maybe you've been with us or watching us for a while, and uh, you just haven't given us any of your information to let us know that you're, uh, that you're with us and uh, allow us to reach out to you, uh, we'd love to hear that information. So if you want to go in, uh, fill that information out, we'd love to hear from you. Also, you'll see there, uh, there's an invitation to join our Slack community. And we, uh, we do that every week. We participate together. Right now in our service, uh, our, a whole bunch of people from our congregation are on Slack, talking to each other, saying hi, uh, enjoying making jokes with each other, and just connecting in this time that we can't necessarily connect with each other in the real world. So we're, we're all there, and we'd love to have you join us there as well. So this morning, we want to welcome you to our service, and we're so glad you're here. Well, good morning, Promise Church. What a great day to come and worship with you. We're going to take this time in the service to welcome the presence of God into our homes. And just because we're not all together in what is our normal building at Chris Hadfield, it doesn't mean God isn't with us, and it doesn't mean that he's not present with us as a community. And so I want to I want to just encourage you with that and let you know that God is still here with you and your family in your home. And today we're going to lift our voices to celebrate that fact and to thank him. It is such a cool thing that God was willing to come to earth and become human so that he could be with us and give us access to him. And so we're going to celebrate that this morning. Why don't you join me?
Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lead down your life. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, you are worthy. Let's sing this. Oh, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King conquered the grave and worthy is the lamb who was slain and worthy is the king who conquered the grave and worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy 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 this is amazing grace this is unfailing love That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Yes, God, we sing this morning you are faithful, God.
waiting for change to come. Knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never God, you are faithful. God, we trust in your faithfulness and we thank you, God. We thank you that you are with us here and that you are getting us through this. God, we thank you for your presence with us this morning in our homes, among all the members of our community and our church. God, we pray that you would bless them and their families. And God, we give this day to you and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, promise. Good morning, Promise Kids. How's everyone doing today? Did everyone show their dads lots of love last week? 
This week, are you ready to start something new? We're gonna learn for a few weeks something totally new. Maybe some of you have heard about it before. We're going to talk about the armor of God. Now in Ephesians, it says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand up against what the devil wants us not to learn. So we're gonna talk about the full armor of God over a couple of weeks, okay? Today, can you guess what we're gonna talk about? Did everybody wear a hat today? We're going to talk about, it's called the helmet of salvation. Like I, I want, I have a big question for you guys. Do you have moms and dads that maybe when they go to work, they have to put on a uniform? I know somebody in my house that when he goes to work, he has to wear steel toe boots. That's to protect his feet. And sometimes if he's on a special job site, he has to wear a helmet to protect his head. Sometimes people that are maybe nurses or doctors, they have to wear something called scrubs. That protects them from all kinds of stuff that they encounter in maybe hospitals or doctor clinics. There's lots of jobs that require having to wear a special uniform to protect them. God says that he wants us to put on the full armor of God so that we are also protected. And today we're gonna to talk about the helmet of salvation. You know, salvation is something that we have to choose to have a relationship with Jesus. And if you've made that choice, that's fantastic. And I'm so proud of you. And I'm sure your mom and dad are proud of you too. When you have a relationship with Jesus, it's like kind of having a relationship with your mom or dad, only a little bit different. Jesus wants to take care of you and look out for you. And he gives us things in the Bible to help protect us because as life goes on, we're gonna walk into situations that maybe are tough or we need some help. So that's why God gives us the armor of God. The helmet of salvation, when we have a relationship with Jesus, the helmet protects our head. If you think about a soldier, everybody close your eyes. Can you see a soldier in your mind? He has a big helmet on his head and it protects his head. Sometimes there will be rocks or arrows being thrown and it will protect their head. Jesus wants us to be protected as well. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, only Jesus. For there's no other name under heaven to men by which we must be saved. That means that there's nobody else that can do what Jesus does for us. Doctors can help us. Nurses can help us, medicines can help us, moms and dads can help us. But when we talk about our souls, about where we're gonna live for the rest of our lives, even after we pass away, only Jesus can do that. In our minds sometimes, kids, maybe we are sad sometimes. Have you been sad that you haven't been able to see your friends? I have been, how about you? Sometimes bad thoughts come into our minds and Satan wants us to do bad things, but Jesus doesn't want us to do that. So today I'm gonna to pray for you. If you have a relationship with Jesus, if you've received salvation from Jesus, then he wants to protect your mind. He wants to protect your head and your eyes. So I'm gonna pray for you today that Jesus will help you and protect you, protect your mind from sad and bad thoughts, okay? So dear Jesus, thank you so much for wanting to protect us. And I pray for all the promised kids and the promised parents that you will just protect their minds from the sadness, from anxiety, from fear, from doubt. And God, I pray that you will just protect our eyes so that we can continue to look for you and look to you and you will be our protector. In all these things we ask, amen. This week, I'm going to send your mom and dad an email all about 
maybe some suggestions on how you can build a helmet. Maybe you can start with a hat and then add some things to make it a helmet. Maybe some feathers up top or a chin strap underneath. Let's see what you can come up with. I'd love to see your pictures. And next week, hmm, next week's gonna be a surprise, but I want you to bring a scarf. Do you think you can dig through all your winter stuff and come out with a scarf? It doesn't have to be super beautiful or pretty, but bring a scarf to church next week and I'll tell you all about where that scarf is gonna go. Have a great week, guys. Watch for the email. Talk to you later. Bye. We're gonna take up our tithes and our offerings right now as we do every single Sunday. And I'll encourage you to go to promisechurch.community to find the green tab in which you will find all of the places that we're, or the place where we're able to give. Um, please make sure that you select the drop down for Promise Church because this is the site for Willowdale Pentecostal Church, our governing organization. So select the drop down for Promise Church. And I just want to reflect on God's faithfulness and how that's affected us at Promise Church. God has been so faithful and has shown himself to be so faithful in all of history and even through this time uh, at Promise Church. And it's God's faithfulness that allows us to be faithful. It allows us to be faithful in our worship. It allows us to be faithful in our dedication time, and it allows us to be faithful in our giving of our finances. Because God is faithful to us, we respond with faithfulness. And Promise Church has been responding with faithfulness, and we can see that. And uh, and so I just want to celebrate that. I want to celebrate that we as a community trust this faithful God, and uh, and and that's what what we see happen. So let's uh, let's give a word of prayer and thanksgiving for God and His faithfulness. God, thank you so much that you are a faithful God and that you have provided in every way for us. And Jesus, we return that faithfulness to you in an act of trust and an act of worship. We ask that that this reciprocal relationship of faithfulness would continue on, that we would see that our faithfulness to you um, is an echo of your faithfulness to us. God, I pray that we would not be found unfaithful when you have been so faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Promise Church. I'm so thankful for this congregation because we have been able to stick together as a community. Through such a crazy time, it has been challenging, it's been trying, and it's had a whole ton of different emotions. One of the challenges that we have ahead of us is reopening. And we recognize that there is a vast difference in terms of how individuals and families have felt about the reality of COVID. And all of us in society have reacted differently to how COVID has affected us. As we start to reopen and invite people into our community, we will be bringing the diverse types of experiences together into one space. And one of my biggest requests as we start to come together and we slowly bring this back is that we respect one another. If you happen to be on the side where COVID-19 has not been something that significantly affected your life, and you feel like we should just be able to do everything and just be back, I totally understand that. And in some ways, I, I, can, I can fully get it. But what I'm asking for you is to respect the, the systems that we're putting in place. Because as, we res as you respect the systems that we're putting in place, we make our space open to people who don't have the same experience as you. To people who feel like this is something that is imminent and uh, destructive. Because in reality, COVID is something that is imminent and destructive. And we must set in place ways to be safe. So for the person that feels that this is something that is very uh, fearful and is something that we should take strong precautions to, I really want to assure you that we are doing our best to make 
all the precautions available. I understand that gathering in a group of people may be challenging to you because for the past three months, we have not been allowed. And so I respect that. We are going to set up as many things as possible to make you feel comfortable to come back. But we are not going to put pressure and say that that is something that you have to do. So for the person that feels that this is very close to their heart and it affects their life, I ask that you, that you do not judge the person who feels that this isn't as much of a concern for them, but that you too would respect and you too would say, everybody is experiencing this differently. So together, I pray that our community would continue to act in a united way as we set in place all of the processes and procedures to make sure that your visit to Promise Church and your experience of our community is safe. We will have signs posted. We will have a screening checkpoint. We will be socially distant. We will have controls on bathroom. We will be ensuring that in every guideline that the government has set out, we are going to take that into consideration for our process. I thank you for being a part of our community, and we look forward to hearing from you. If you have any questions or concerns, or you want to give feedback and suggestions, you know that my, that my email is always open. You can phone me, you can email me, or you can text me on Slack. And I would love to hear how you're experiencing this and some of the suggestions that you would have. Once again, we thank you so much for being involved in Promise Church. And we pray that as we move forward, we would acknowledge that people have experienced it differently and respect each other in such ways that we're able to say we can come together safely and in one place to worship God. Thank you for being part of Promise Church. At Promise Church, we like to do spiritual practices together. And the reason that I'm actually sitting here in my own living room is because uh, when we do these, we can actually, instead of just doing this together on a Sunday morning, this is actually stuff that you can do on your own at your home, where you can engage with God in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever it is you choose to do this. And so that's why I'm sitting here in my living room this morning. And so together, we're going to actually practice silence together today. And... This is something that is, for us, it's something that we have to be intentional about. That, you know, our culture, in our culture, we find generally, we find silence uncomfortable. And I'm not just talking about auditory silence. I'm talking about, uh, you know, there's lots of sources of noise in our lives. So, for example, like how many of us will, when we're standing in line at, you know, the grocery store, uh, we'll pull out our phones and, and, you know, scroll through social media or look at news headlines, even just swipe through pages of apps just to just to keep ourselves occupied and, and just to do something while we wait. You know, maybe through this time that a lot of us have been at home, we've been preoccupied with TV or movies or social media or, you know, getting caught up, you know, browsing endless news headlines. And sometimes we do this to distract ourselves from what's actually going on inside of ourselves, our thoughts, our emotions, our desires, our anxieties, our fears. And when we sit in silence, we're forced to acknowledge the things that are going on inside of ourselves. We're forced to confront those things. And when we do that, we're given the choice of what to do with those things. Are those things that, you know, the things that we, we try to distract ourselves from, are we going to try and, when we recognize them, are we going to try and carry those on our own? Or are we going to allow God to come in and do what he wants to do with those things? Are we going to trust God to bring hope and healing and truth to our souls through, the, through a practice of silence. So this morning, I'm going to read from Psalm, uh, Psalm 62. And we're going to spend just three minutes in silence. And uh, in that time, what I'd like you to do is just to take note 
of the things that are going on inside of yourself. And, and take note of what your mind goes to in this time. And maybe you'll recognize that as something that you're using to distract yourself. Maybe it's, you know, you're thinking about, you know, even something as simple as what's for lunch today. And, and the things that you use to avoid thinking about what's actually going on inside yourself. Or maybe you'll sit there and the things that surface, the things that come to your mind are going to be the things that you are stressed or anxious about. The things that you've been trying to avoid. And in this moment, we have, uh, we have the opportunity to take note of those things and allow God to speak to us with what he wants us to do with these thoughts. So just take note of those. So this morning, I'm going to read Psalm, part of Psalm 62, and then we're going to spend just a couple of minutes in silence together. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. The only plan, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through this practice. We thank you that in these moments where we sit and we confront the things that are going on inside of ourselves, that we know we don't have to face them alone because you are with us. 
God, as you lead and direct us through the thoughts that are going on in our own minds, as you bring awareness to the things that we are using to distract ourselves, as you bring awareness to the things that we need to change that might be uncomfortable in our lives, God, we, we trust that you are leading us through that. That when we sit and, and allow ourselves to, uh, to deal with the, the thoughts that sometimes we try to avoid, that you give us the strength and the courage to work through those things. And that, God, you are guiding us through all of this. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us in this spiritual practice this morning. Well, we're so glad to be able to dive into God's Word today. And today we're starting the continuation of preparing for the presence of God. This is a two-series um, set, and so we're going into the second series today. Previously, we've spoken of being called into God's story, that this story isn't about us, but it's God's. We've, we've spoken about the authority that we find in Scripture because it's in the multi-thousand-year journey that God, who transcends time, reveals himself. And there's no way that we in our short lifespans could ever comprehend the grand nature of God simply by our observations. And so we rely on the authority of Scripture to be able to guide us into understanding what God has done uh, to understand what God is doing, and to be able to understand what God will do. And so we talked about that. We talked about um, not being able to accept any substitutions for Scripture because Scripture reveals Christ. It reveals the entire purpose and plan of God. And so we must be very careful as we navigate our Christian faith to ground it not in society's thoughts and good memes and good logic, but to ground it first in Scripture and allow good logic to come out of Scripture, to allow great memes to come out of Scripture. And so that's where we base everything that we are, are working on in our Christian life. And we took an entire sermon to go through the grand narrative that is God's purpose and plan that's taken thousands of years to unfold. Today, we're going to continue to look at what happens when the presence of God changes us and how Jesus changes us. And, uh, and there's going to be a whole piece in that. But before we dig into it, I just want to take a moment and pray. God, I'm thankful. I'm so thankful for your work. I'm so thankful that you transcend all of this. God, that you transcend my life, that you transcend every person that will ever hear this sermon's life, that you existed well before and that you will exist well after. God, I thank you that you are faithful and you have continued on a single course with humanity, a course to redeem them, a course to live with them, and a course to make all things right. And so, Jesus, I pray that as we study the Word today, that we would find our expectation of your presence grounded in Scripture, and that we would see how it changes and influences and impacts our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, when we meet Jesus, he changes us. When we meet Jesus, he changes us, and he changes us in unexpected ways. And this is the beautiful truth of Christianity. I said at the beginning of this last sermon series on preparing for the presence of God that we don't really believe that the presence of God is real. But when we meet Jesus... He changes us. We're going to read a big passage of Scripture today, and I encourage you to follow along. Uh, you can find it at promisechurch.community in today's message, um, or you can find it in the script in the Bible, whatever you use. You can use an app. I read out of the ESV. So I'm going to read it today, and it's Romans 6, verses 1 to 16. It's a very important 
passage of scripture. Now, as we dive into Romans, I need to give us a couple of, of pieces that are really, really important for us to understand in terms of context. Um, Paul is speaking in all of Romans to two people groups. The first people group that he's speaking to are the Jews, the people who have the law and they know what is expected of them by God because of the previous authority of scripture. So they have the law that they rely on and they know that this is, this is what it is. And the second people group that he's speaking to is the people group that is uh, the Gentiles. And they're trying to follow Jesus, but they don't understand how Jesus changes them and what parts of them need to change and what parts need to be kept the same. And so there's a, a tension that's built up in the Roman church where, where the Jews are imposing certain views and practices on the Gentiles, and Paul is working to straighten that out. So I'm going to read this passage to us right now, and then we're going to get into um, how Jesus changes us and what meeting with God actually does. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in, the, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one who has died has been set free from... For... Whoops, sorry... For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin reign, therefore, in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin, because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So up to this point where you commit to following Jesus, you're ultimately responsible for every action, for everything that you do, and you get to determine every single course of action you take, every emotion you you allow to come through you. It's all you. It is fully within your purview and your own decision. You can quite honestly do whatever you want. That's before you meet with the person of Jesus Christ. When we want to know the presence of God in our life, uh, we assume that we want God to come in. And when he comes in, he challenges that that level of uh, control. He challenges that perception that we have in our life that we can do whatever we want. And God comes in and he challenges it. A few weeks ago, I talked about Christianity um, using ownership language when it comes to God. And one of the greatest, most honest evangelism 
truths is that this is about ownership of my life. Jesus talks about laying down our lives as he lays down his life. And we see this imitation of Christ where the ownership is deferred to someone who is far greater than us. You know, and and that's challenging because in our culture, in the way we grew up, autonomy is vital. It's It's close to one of our core values. That the autonomy to do what you want The freedom to be the type of person you want to be, to act just as you want in the exact situation, is a very, very tight value in our culture. We are individuals. We are strong. We are self-sustaining. We are independent. We can do it. And this is brought into us right from our childhood. We, we talk about giving our children independence. We ensure that they have everything, and this is well and good. See, God works to give us freedom. But the question is, freedom to what end? And what is freedom? How does this play work between the ownership of God and the autonomy of the individual? What is freedom? See, Is freedom the ability to survive? Is freedom the the striving to provide? I mean, are you you free to chain yourself to a desk 60 hours a week and make sure that you live in the freedom of purchasing a nice new cottage? You know, is, is that freedom? What are we really free to do? And what freedoms control our decisions? This line of thinking was really brought to my attention as I came home from a mission trip from Malawi. And I was on a plane that was traveling from Addis Ababa to Rome. And seated next to me was a, uh, an Islamic man dressed in full formal religious attire. And so there was no mistaking that I was sitting next to to an Islamic man. And, you know, coming home from a mission trip, I felt pretty sure that God had put him there so that I could teach him something about the truth of, of God. And he surprised me a lot. He asked me a couple of questions and he said, you know, what do the clouds make you think of? What do you see when you look out the window? And I said, I see the beauty of God's creation. He said, yeah, me too. And I was like, oh, okay, I see how this is going to go, you know. And, uh, and, and he said, you know, Western Christians, big generalization, don't think that we believe in God, but we do. We believe that God is the creator of all this. And he said, what I don't understand about Western Christian- Christianity is you Westerners think that you're free. And I said, well, we are free. And he said, you Westerners think that you're free to do whatever you want and you complain about us and all of the rules that we live by. And I just listened because I I learned very quickly that I wasn't there to teach him something, but that I was there to listen. And he said, I want you to consider this. He said, look at the airplane attendant that worked for Ethiopian Airlines. And there she was, and she was wearing her uniform. And he said, Because of the uniform that she is forced to wear because of her employer, there are many men on this flight who have already considered lustful thoughts about this airline attendant. Is she free? Is she free to be free of all of their impulses? And he went on and on and talked about what freedom is and how freedom is found inside of God. And you know, while I don't believe the Islamic religion, and and there are definite differences between Islam and Christianity, he did have a good point. He said the freedom that Westerns feel is a freedom to follow their own impulses. They can do what they want, and that's not the freedom that God has for us. That point stood. You know, what is freedom? Society really does say that freedom is is the ability to choose what you want to do. Financial freedom is, is the freedom to be able to buy what you want, when you want, with no restrictions. We think about freedom in terms of uh, a teenager would think about freedom, about how late they can stay out because they just want to. 
And they think about freedom in terms of what they can buy. And a man might think about freedom in terms of having a man cave that's separated from the rest of the family where they can do what they want and be what they want. There's nothing innately wrong with all of this. But there is a piece where we have to think about what are we free to? Are we free to fall into the vices that are part of our life? Are we free just to make sure that we can drink as much as we want? Is that freedom? Is a woman free to purchase as much alcohol as she wants and then allows herself to drink as much as she wants? Is that freedom or is she bound by something? See, the Bible suggests in the passage that we just wrote that, that there is slavery at hand. We become slaves to our impulses, to the sins that pull at us, that tempt us, that say, you need to do this right now, and we become slaves to them because the one that you obey, the one that you obey It says, do you not know that if you present yourself to anybody as obedient slaves, as obedient, you are slaves of the one you obey, either sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness? Are we really free? Or do we find ourselves enslaved by our own vices? The vices that get put on us that society celebrates and downplays and says that's not a big deal, but yet we can't escape them. The presence of God comes in and sets us free from our impulses. The freedom is God's strength to overcome the slavery of impulses that can destroy your family. The slavery of impulses that can destroy your future. The slavery of impulses that can, control, that can destroy your hope. We're freed from those things in Jesus Take a look at the passage again. I'm going to point out six comparisons that lead us to what freedom from slavery is. Look at this. We've got right at the beginning, we have a baptism. You're baptized into death to live a new life. It's a contrast right in verse three. You're baptized into death to live a new life. You know, you've got, we are united with him in death. This is verse five. And then we're united with him in resurrection. There's this death language is about the vices and the sins that destroy us. And the, and the life language is about the new way in which God changes us so that we live without those destructive forces in our life. The third one is we're ruled by sin. That's what I'm talking about, the internal impulses that are unchecked. And then we are set free from sin. Like, this is, this is amazing. And that's, that's in verse 6. Um, we, are di- we died with Christ, and so we live with Christ. This is the fourth one. The fifth one is we are dead to sin, and now we are alive to Christ. And sin, the sixth one is sin will not be your master. You have been set free from sin, and you are owned by righteousness. Owned by righteousness. Verse 17, which I haven't read, says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. This is, this is the thankfulness that we have to God because in the presence of God, we are changed. Jesus changes us. And he sets us free from the vices that destroy us. Jesus, what change did Jesus bring? Jesus sets me free from the bondage of sin. I I bicycled across Canada in 2005, and when I ended, I got to a friend's house in, um, she lived in Vancouver, just outside of Vancouver, and uh, and we were talking about um, this theological thing, and she said, what is the greatest sin? And I was like, I, I don't know, you know, um, came up with a bunch of options. And, and, and she was like, it's independence. It's the fight in each one of us to say, I get to do my own thing. 
I get to be my own person. I get to be the author of my life. And she says, that is one of our greatest sins. Upon that, all other sins hinge. Jesus sets me free from the bondage of sin. And so I allow God to take that, that fight for independence. And I say, God, I want to be dependent on you. In the moments where sin and vices come and attack us, we find that we are able to rely on the changes that God brings in us. And when we don't see that, Martin Luther says that the old man that Paul's referring to here, the the man that sins, the man who's still slave, you know, although he's dead, he still kicks sometimes. And we see that. It happens in our life. And God is in the process of changing us. And it's in the presence of God that we are changed. When we prepare for the presence of God, we prepare for this transcendent being who come, who reveals himself in Scripture to come into our lives and start to change us and set us free from the slavery to the, to the sin and to the impulses that drive us. You know, the second thing that, that the second change that Jesus brings is, is Jesus says that uh, he, un- he changes my understanding of ownership. <clears throat> and it's really, really important. One of my young favorite verses, and I say it a lot because I want us to know it. He, it's Luke 9, 23. It says, and he said to them all, if anybody would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24 says, for whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So we see that, that God is asking us to offer up ownership. Jesus changes my understanding of ownership. And Jesus, the calling of Jesus changes everything about it. You know, the slavery that Israel was freed from in Egypt, the slavery that they came through in the Exodus, is equivalent to the slavery to sin and impulses that I have, that God has set us free. And when Israel came out of Egypt, God said, I am the Lord your God. I am the one who owns your life now. You owe allegiance to me. As God sets you free from the vices that you experience, your type of Egypt, God now writes on your heart that you are his. And we owe him our allegiance. So in our verse today, we're invited into the freedom from slavery to celebrate God's presence in our life that transforms us. See, it does really cost everything. It's why it's the most honest evangelism statement to say that Christianity is about giving up ownership of your life because it makes us count the cost. It costs us everything but it is completely worth it because the freedom and the life that we live in is not destructive. It is not self-centered. It is not harmful to others. But the life that Jesus calls us to loves God and loves others as God allows us to love ourselves. And there's so much strength in that. Next sermon, we're going to continue to discuss the freedom that God's called us to. Um, But today, we are just evaluating the ownership of our life. Once again, saying, God, am I really ready for your presence? Allow me to be ready. Do the work that allows me to know that I am set free. Let me pray for you. God, there are people in our congregation. (laughs) There is me who stand in your presence and say that we have vices that we find ourselves enslaved to. We might say, oh, well, it's in my heritage. Or, oh, well, it's in my, my family structure. Or, oh, well, it's in my personality makeup. And while the reasons for our vices may run deep, 
your spirit runs deeper still. And so God, we offer our allegiance to you and we ask you to free us from the things that hold us into slavery so that we may live to you in the freedom that you have established for us. God, it's in this moment that we find our hearts repentant. We find our hearts realizing those vices that still hold a claw or a grip on us and we, and we submit them to you. And we ask you that we will be baptized into your death so that we can live again in your life. Only you can do this work. Only you are the one that sets us free from, from the vices and the evil that, that tempt us and ensnare us. And so we submit to you again. And we ask you to faithfully do the work that we rely on you to do. We are willing participants in the change. Give us wisdom, guidance, perseverance, and help us understand your grace. More than anything, help us understand your grace. We are so thankful for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you and pray that you have a wonderful week.